Welcome everyone. Uh, welcome to today's event. My name is Heidi Lee and I'm joining you today from the Wurundjeri land of the Kulin Nation and pay my respects to our elders past, present and those emerging. Um, I am the Beyond Zero Emissions Project Lead for the Million Jobs Plan and I'm your host for this investors briefing on some of our most recent and exciting work in renewable energy industrial precincts. So for some of you who may not have spent much time with BZE before, we are an internationally recognised think tank. We use research and technical solutions to show how Australia can thrive through this transition that we're on to a zero emissions economy. So we've been around for just over 10 years and we've mapped a path to zero emissions across all sectors of the economy. And we've also worked with regional communities to take these big ideas and ground them in local context including last year in the Northern Territory, in Collie and WA, and this year, our regional focus is on the Hunter Valley. Beyond Zero Emissions, we have a unique volunteer powered business model, which provides a platform for researchers and technical experts and comms volunteers to come together and crowdsource the development of the projects that we do. So our current work, our Million Jobs Plan, is a framework for economic recovery. In our research, we have mapped out how we can rebuild our nation through investing in really practical projects and, and some of those you're going to hear about today. Um, these are gonna modernize our industries and reskill the workforce and deliver this, this bright and prosperous economic future that we know can be ahead of us. So due to popular demand, I wanna let you all know that we are recording this event. And we're also joined today by a journalist from Renew Economy, welcome Michael. Uh, but this means that the entire show today is on the record. After today, you'll receive a copy of the slides and we'll provide a chance for you to connect with the speakers that you hear from in a follow-up pack. So you can ask off the record questions, but you have to do that tomorrow, not, not today. So opening with a, a special thank you to WWF, Ironbark and Energy Estate for partnering with BZE to produce the Renewable Energy Industrial Precinct briefing paper that most of you will have got with your invitation to attend today. And each of these investment ready projects that you're going to hear about today will provide this important backbone for the whole manufacturing sector in Australia to be able to transition to renewable energy and capture those benefits like improving our competitiveness and building these really strong onshore value chains. And um, as you'll hear about today, capitalizing on the green hydrogen market. Today's agenda, we're gonna move through things in three parts. First of all, you'll hear about the technical and financial rationale for renewable energy industrial precincts. That you'll hear first from Michael Lord, BZE's lead researcher about the technical solutions, and then Clark Butler from IEFA, if he has managed the Canberra rain correctly uh, and, and arrived on time. Clark will also be here and he'll tell us next about the, um, he's, he's from IEFA, he has a background in corporate finance, and he'll tell us about the investment case. Hopefully he's here. We're then gonna get four project presentations, each introduced by BZE's Investment Reference Group Chairperson, Christian Keel. Um, they're gonna show us how renewable powering, powered manufacturing sector is actually already underway um, and showcase these four investment ready opportunities. The third big part is where we get to hear from you. So our speakers are gonna keep their project overviews really short and punchy because we really wanna make space for your questions. Ask your questions in the chat. We had originally um, anticipated that we would maybe get, you know, 20 or 30 people interested in coming along today and rarely for BZE, but we did actually underestimate ourselves. So we have a lot more people on the call. We will do our questions in writing just to make sure that we can keep track of them all, get as many of them um, answered as we can today. And those that we can't answer in person now, we will do in our follow-ups. So um, over now to our first three speakers, Michael, then Clark, and then Christian. Great, thanks Heidi. Um, so a renewable energy industrial precinct as we conceive them is simply a cluster of manufacturers all using low cost renewable energy. So they'd be probably in uh, existing industrial zones where the manufacturers can benefit from shared infrastructure, brownfield land and a local skilled workforce. And we see them as becoming ecosystems of manufacturing and innovation 
where the network of companies can share infrastructure and resources and ideas. Uh, they're places where we can secure the presence in Australia of existing manufacturers, but also attract new ones and grow new businesses. And I think uh, there are three reasons why manufacturers would be attracted to these precincts. The first one is pretty simple, cheap power. I think on this call, we all know that the way we're gonna get cheaper power in Australia is with solar and wind and renewable energy. The second reason is lower emissions. So um, it's probably not an exaggeration to say that global supply chains are going to undergo a revolution. And this is driven largely by the emissions reductions targets of thousands of global corporations. Um, when you have businesses of the size and importance of uh, Apple and VW and Toyota saying that they're going to be carbon neutral right across their value chain, then manufacturers across the world need to take notice. And that's already starting to happen. We're seeing with a product like aluminium that the market for aluminium is splitting into low carbon and high carbon. Investors are also taking notice um, and equating high carbon with high risk. I think the response to today's um, invitations that Heidi mentioned showed it shows the interest in investors in um, low carbon manufacturing. And the third reason businesses will come to this precinct is because they'll be incubators for the development of innovative zero emissions and circular economy technologies. And advanced manufacturers, ambitious startups will see something that they want to be a part of. And uh, the, the type of businesses we see coming to these precincts are, yes, energy intensive businesses like those that produce metals like aluminium and chemicals like hydrogen and ammonia but also manufacturers of the equipment that's needed for the zero emissions transition. So wind turbines, batteries, chargers, electrical mining equipment, things like that. And then other manufacturers, things like um, advanced manufacturers, things like uh, carbon fiber, 3D printing, and low carbon cement. So finally, uh, this isn't about picking winners. It's about grasping an opportunity to revitalize Australian manufacturing. Let's remember not every country has this prospect. Uh, most of our industrial competitors like Germany, uh, China, Japan, the United States will find it much harder to decarbonize at the same time as expanding manufacturing. Australia is fortunate that it does have this opportunity. So let's waste it. Thank you. going straight over to Clark, who I can see is here. I think so. I am here. Ah, okay, great. Straight into you, Clark. Yes. Good afternoon. Apologies. I'm sitting in the car in the rain. I hope that doesn't detract from what I'm saying. Um, yeah, to follow on Michael's point, the, the main attraction, um, I think, from an investor point of view, um, an industry and energy precinct, is the ability to aggregate. Uh, in the first instance, aggregating demand for, from intensive uh, energy industries to create the investment certainty needed to deploy large scale um, renewable energy. And because renewable um, energy generation is largely a game of capital, uh, there are really strong benefits of scale. So by aggregating that demand and providing the, um, the offtake that investors need to finance their projects, they can put forward projects of immense scale like the one that Simon Curry will talk about uh, later today. The, the second aspect is uh, providing a um, certainty about energy cost for the precinct. Um, you will have seen aluminium like uh, really struggling to make profits in Australia because of their input cost, the, the electricity and, and the gas. The, the, the benefit of creating a precinct approach is we can apply the economic value of that for the whole precinct and provide um, energy at a, at a foundational level that is internationally competitive. Um, and secondly, when you use um, the, the base load of say aluminium, uh, which is a really significant energy user, 12% of New South Wales and more than 13% of Queensland, you can underwrite the, um, the renewable energy investment 
and but also provide a significant amount of surplus electricity into the precinct which can be used for intermittent um, purposes such as hydrogen electrolysis one of the main challenges of uh, high, of developing a hydrogen economy is the is the very uh, high cost of the combination of electricity and uh, um, electrolyzers by running electrolyzers effectively on top of the foundational load of existing energy users uh, we can provide a, a relatively low marginal cost the, and then the third aspect that investors should find attractive about um, uh, precinct development is operating at this we we'll just give Clark another 10 seconds to try and reconnect. Uh, I think it's a bit of a technical difficulty. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, have, have you lost you're back, me? You're back now. Hello? You probably missed the last 15 seconds. Oh, I'm sorry about that. So point, have... point three. <laughs> <laughs> Apologies. Point, point three. Um, the, 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 the operating at such scale means that um, we, we have an opportunity to invest in local manufacturing of the components that go to, to creating the renewable energy zone. And you'll hear a lot about that today in relation to batteries. Uh, and 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 Mark's business. Um, uh, apologies for the the connection issue. I'll um I'll end up there. Thank you. Thank you very much, Clark, and uh, thank you as well, Michael, for the for the fantastic introduction. So uh, before we dive into our project overview, I just wanted to provide you with some context for how the REIPs came about and how the projects presented today were selected. Uh, as mentioned, the REIPs were highlighted as part of the Moon Jobs Plan report. The ambitious national vision outlined how Australia could create 1 million jobs through blended public and private finance and targeted policy and regulation changes over five years. Uh, a call for projects was issued through our networks and via extensive stakeholder engagement. And through this process, over 700 projects were identified. So BZD is now the proud beneficiary of a, an opportunity pipeline of over 700 projects. From these 700, um, 15 were identified as our federal fast track projects. And these are the projects identified as the most likely to receive federal government support. The fast track projects covered a range of key emission sectors, including buildings and um, building retrofits, so transmission lines and transport, as well as the three areas that we're focusing on today. So the manufacturing hubs, power generation, and the battery and, and other manufacturing. So if you look at the opportunities for REIPs through manufacturing hubs, we can attract onshore manufacturing we, um, and we've got the Central Queensland Project Hub um, opportunity today. So Simon Corbell, the Chief Advisor of Energy Estate, will present this uh, in a couple of moments time. In the power generation space, we have the opportunity to enable green industry by powering REIPs with renewables through energy and heat. And so our two projects that we're showing you today are the Star of the South, which will be presented by Aaron Colden, the Chief Development Officer from Star of the South, and Walker Energy Project, presented by Simon Curry, who's a principal at Energy Estate. Uh, and, and last but not least, uh, in the battery and other manufacturing space, we have the opportunity to establish an onshore value chain for battery manufacturing and other industries of the future. So um, we're gonna look at the Energy Renaissance Battery Manufacturing Project, and this will be presented by Mark Chilcott, who's the Managing Director of Energy Renaissance. So to start, I'll hand over to Simon Corbell, our Chief Advisor of Energy Estate. Thanks, Simon. Thanks very much, Christian, and thank you uh, to everyone who has joined this very important webinar this afternoon to discuss opportunities around renewable energy industrial precincts. Today I'm speaking to you about the Central Queensland Power Project, which is being developed jointly between Energy Estate and our partners, RES Australia. RES is an independently owned wind developer and one of the largest independently owned renewable energy developers uh, in the world. Central Queensland Power is located around the Port of Gladstone and it's designed to deliver two gigawatts of wind, solar and storage uh, plus a clean energy industrial precinct uh, in the Port of Gladstone area. The total project value is around $6.7 billion and we are positioning this project fundamentally to drive new opportunities for manufacturing existing heavy industry operations 
and the capacity to create new value chains and new export opportunities. As a business, we've been very focused on central Queensland power now for over a year. And in fact, this is the genesis of the renewable energy industrial precincts work. We're delighted that BZE and WWF have picked up and magnified this concept. In the Gladstone context, we're focusing on the central Queensland industrial park, which will be developed uh, in industrial land in the Port of Gladstone area. Central Queensland Power will deliver both the power solution to drive new manufacturing opportunities in Gladstone, and it will help facilitate the development of the Central Queensland Industrial Park. The two gigawatts of wind, solar and storage that will be developed as part of the Central Queensland Power Project will first of all help to meet existing heavy industry operations in the Gladstone area. Obviously there is an existing aluminium smelter, there is other green chemical manufacture, there's other chemical manufacture and concrete manufacture in the uh, Gladstone area. We believe there are very significant opportunities to allow these existing heavy industry players to switch to a firm renewable energy solution. And that's part of what CQP can offer to this very important and strategic industrial port in central Queensland. But the other aspect is focusing on the delivery of a new manufacturing precinct. When you look at the scope of the Central Queensland Power Project, there is over two gigawatts of new build renewables to occur and many more gigawatts when you look at other projects outside of our own proposal in the broader renewable energy zone. For that reason, we believe that a new manufacturing park powered by renewables can look at the delivery of new tower manufacturing for wind farms, new turbine and nacelle assembly capabilities, new capacity to deliver transformers, uh, electrolyzers for hydrogen manufacture, and a broad range of other new technologies. For this reason, we're gonna be partnering with businesses such as ITM, GE, Vestas and Keppel Prince to explore the development and drive the cornerstone businesses that we need for the Central Queensland Industrial Park. In wrapping up, I'd like to stress that we are well advanced in the delivery of this project. We have strong support from the Queensland Coordinator General and the broader Queensland Government through Trade and Investment Queensland for the development of this new proposal. We've also had uh, excellent support in identifying a, a broad range of potential sites for the Central Queensland Industrial Precinct, including around Aldoga, Yarwin, and the Gladstone Port itself, that all have the appropriate industrial zoning. CQP's wind, solar, and storage, together with the capacity for hydrogen production, can facilitate the transition to a firm green energy future for heavy industry in Central Queensland. It's about securing the future development of that heavy industry through low cost fixed price renewables, as well as creating opportunities for new industrial and manufacturing capacity in a key industrial port. Thanks very much for the opportunity to speak to you about Central Queensland Power today. Fantastic, Simon. What an exciting opportunity for the area. So I'm now, now gonna hand over to Erin Colden from Star of the South. Erin, hand over to you. Thanks, Christian. And um, first of all, thank you to everyone for joining the call. I am very excited to have this opportunity to talk about offshore wind, and particularly in these times where it's more difficult to get out and about and meet you all. Um, I must say this is my biggest challenge of the day, condensing an overview of our project into three minutes. Um, but I'll try and focus on really what the key theme is here that we're all talking about. And the word that stands out for me, and I think Simon used this word a number of times, is opportunity. So if we're to capture this opportunity of renewable energy industrial precincts, we're going to need a lot of renewable energy power. And that's really what offshore wind represents, starting with the Star of the South, which for those of you who are not familiar, is quite a large renewable energy project, 2.2 gigawatts. And often we get asked, why so big? That's very ambitious. We don't have an offshore wind industry here. Why would you start with such a large project? I think quite simply is the scale does offer us opportunities to attract 
the supply chain, the international supply chain that's booming in offshore wind as one of the fastest growing technologies to set up in places like Gippsland and the Latrobe Valley and to get that industry started here. One of the other reasons which I don't need to explain to people on this call is the significant challenge we do face in this transition. And I like what Michael said, that it's not about picking winners in terms of technologies with respect to different types of renewables. The reality is we're going to need um, resources and technologies that are complementary. And it's one of the other benefits of offshore wind is the strength and the consistency and the diversity of that wind profile, which really complements the onshore resource and strengthens that entire portfolio of renewables. Um, just touching on jobs, I think it's really important for where we are located with our project, Gippsland and Latrobe Valley. Um, many of you know, has been the home of power generation for many, many years. And special shout out to any friends from Gippsland on the call. I did see your name, Chris Barfoot here. And um, really for us, that is what drives our team. It's about continuing that tradition of power generation, creating thousands of jobs, not only direct jobs, through the very large project that we would have and those ongoing opportunities, but also those downstream supply chain opportunities. And I think you can talk about numbers and look at modeling of how many jobs you can create, but it doesn't really tell the story of those coastal towns. We've heard so many stories from Gippsland, whether it's parents who are emailing us to say they've got teenage children that they know that will leave when they turn 18 because there's just no opportunities there with some of those declining industries, not just in power generation, but in oil and gas exploration, in fishing, uh, the impacts of COVID that are having on tourism. And really it's about creating those ongoing opportunities that give people hope and opportunity to stay in their region, keep families together, and ultimately work towards powering a broader sector of manufacturing opportunities. So just in closing, I'm sure my three minutes is at a close. I did want to touch very briefly on why offshore wind. Um, and I think if you look at the growth, 30 gigawatts installed worldwide at the moment, it's projected to grow to 230 gigawatts by 2030, led by Asia Pacific region. And again, that represents Australia's opportunity. This isn't just a European industry. Um, that's often thriving there, there really is a chance here for us in Australia to capitalise on that growth and be part of this technology journey. Thank you. Thank you, Erin. What a great project for an exciting new industry. I'm going to hand over now to Simon Curry uh, to talk about the Walker Energy Project. Thanks, Simon. Great. Thanks, Christian. I, I think I'd like to talk about Star of the South instead. Um, <laughs> But um, back to Walker. Um, so Walker is the largest renewable energy project in the NEM, uh, even bigger than Star of the South. Uh, it is the anchor for the New England res and will help New, New South Wales transition from coal-fired power to renewables quickly. Uh, Vestas acquired the first uh, wind farm last year and GE has come on board recently as the partner for the Dungowan um, pump storage hydro. But it's much more than just another renewable energy project. There's a 5% carried interest for the landowners, neighbours and communities, which is unique for a project of this scale anywhere. Uh, we want to deliver better outcomes for local stakeholders, such as facilitating broadband for farms within a few kilometres of the wind farms and transmission lines. Uh, as we all realise, data access is absolutely vital for our life and business these days. We cement our social licence by doing things like bringing sculpture by the sea artists up to Walker which happens to have the largest number of public art sculptures per capita in the country. A key development principle for us is maximizing local content. Uh, now, local supply chains can start small, like choosing to use Fulcrum 3D as a leading local manufacturer and local technology companies like MyPella Geo Solutions. They can grow by using locally manufactured and cut steel for all transmission towers. If it's good enough for the frigates, it must be good enough and cheap enough for all new transmission lines across Australia. Uh, we just need developers, contractors and the TNSPs to commit to using local steel rather than imported flat pack towers. We are pro promoting the establishment of energy transition training centre in Tamworth in view of its growing workforce and its critical location sitting at the bottom of the New England res and above the existing and transitioning resources industries in the Hunter. Our goal is to connect the New England res 
directly to the existing infrastructure in the Hunter through a new transmission line from Urala to Liddell. It just so happens that Liddell is electrically connected with Tomago. Delivering affordable clean power to industry will help keep smelting in Australia and encourage new industry like Energy Renaissance, so coming up next. Another good example is the Lavo Hydrogen Manufacturing Hub, which aims to commercialize world leading hydrogen storage technology out, out of UNSW and attract global electrolyzer and fuel cell manufacturers. This also made the BZE short, fast track shortlist and again, hopefully will be located in the Hunter. What we'd also love to support uh, is wind tower and the cell or blade manufacturing in Newcastle, um, which looks like we'll be competing with Gladstone. Uh, I'll get to that in a minute. Uh, to make this happen, we will need much deeper collaboration across industry, off takers, governments and capital providers, mandating minimum levels of local content. But to finish us off, this isn't just about Walga, the Hunter or New South Wales. It's about how we can create a thriving ecosystem of industries across the country which support each other. We don't need each state to compete. We need to build, build upon our manufacturing strengths, steel and Waiala, transformers in Albury Wodonga, trucks, buses and Dandelong, Newcastle, Townsville, CRCs encouraging new processing industries, just like WA is doing with batteries, more special activation precincts located in the right places. Um, so, what we'd like to do is, uh, with Walka is to effectively demonstrate that Australia's strength as a clean manufacturing centre in the future will be built off the abundant clean energy resources and focusing on key things for the future, such as provenance and how partnerships can deliver on the sustainable development goals. Fantastic. Thank you, Simon. What a well integrated project and <clears throat> great partnership with the community there as well. Fantastic. So I'll move on now um, to Energy Renaissance and Mark Chilcott. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Christian. Um, my name's Mark Chilcott. I'm the Managing Director of Energy Renaissance. Um, I'm also an investor in Energy Renaissance and passionate about the, uh, the potential benefits we can bring to the environment and also passionate about converting Australian raw materials into a, a value-added product. Um, both of both boxes we, we tick. Um, I started my career in La Trobe Valley, a Law and W station. Sorry, Erin, I was one of the ones that, uh, that left. Um, so I've been in the energy industry my entire life. I spent more than 10 years in Switzerland um, building power generation assets, including renewables um, around the, the globe. Um, I've then come back, we come back home about 10 years ago I've worked for Leighton's and UGL once again in the renewable energy field, um, solar farms, wind farms, and we put in the first large scale battery in, uh, in Western Australia when, when I was with UGL. Um, I guess in my career, which has been fairly long, I've never witnessed a, an energy transformation like we're in the middle of at the moment. It's, um, you know, from um, sort of transitioning into the renewables and the demand on on, on battery storage. So from our perspective, that's what we're, we're capitalising on the battery storage. And it obviously goes a lot broader than um, generation into electric vehicles and the like. Um, at ER, we're manufacturing uh, lithium ion battery storage solutions. Um, so with the help of CSIRO, with the support of CSIRO, um, we've developed internal IP around the the casing and the storage of the, the cell. We've developed our own um, battery management system. Um, and we've licensed cell te technology out of a um, company called Cadenza Innovations in the United States. Um, one of the, well, two, the two benefits um, that set us apart from our competitors are, firstly, our batteries don't suffer from what's called thermal runaway. Um, or thermal, thermal cascade, so, so they don't catch on fire. Um, and the second thing that we've uh, developed the IP around is as so as the batteries operate in hot climates, um, you know, particularly focused on the Australian uh, environment and, and Southeast Asian environment. So generally up to 30% of the battery can be, can be used to store, uh, cool itself. Um, our batteries will, um, will require a lot less of that parasitical load. 
Um, advanced manufacture, we've, we've swum against the tide until unfortunately COVID hit where, uh, you know, the tide sort of turned and advanced manufacture is becoming more, um, you know, more accepted, I think. But there were two areas that, that we focused on. Um, one was labour cost. Um, labour cost is about 15% of our COGS. Um, so it's not a major contributor to, to our competitiveness. Um, I think it was Simon raised it before. Our energy cost is, on the other hand, though, a, a significant contributor. So we're about 35% energy um, in our COGS. Um, Australia, I mean, everyone will know on, the, on this webinar, Australia's got the best renewable energy source of anywhere in the world. So, so we'll, um, we'll um, use wind and, and solar and our own batteries to, to get on top of this 35% um, cog, cogs around our energy. Um, where are we up to? We're, um, we've made a decision to deploy the, the factory in regional, uh, regional New South Wales. Um, there'll be an announcement in the next um, three or four weeks as to the, to the location of that. We're not, not ready to announce that just yet, but uh, we'll, we'll be very shortly. Um, we've got the, we've signed up with a developer. He's uh, in the process, or they're in the process of designing the facility and uh, um, getting the relevant permits and what have you for the facility. Um, we've ordered the equipment. Unfortunately, the um, manufacturing equipment isn't manufactured here in Australia. We've ordered that in China. Um, it's just at the end of its detailed design phase. Um, it'll be on our shores in February of next year. And we hope to be, um, we'll, we will be deploying product in, in June of 2021. So June of, June of next year. Um, we're just about to transition um, chairperson. So there'll be a, um, an announcement about that in the next week or so. Our outgoing chair, Sue McCluskey, is on the um, COVID council for the federal government. So she, um, she's a bit time poor at the moment. Um, so we've got an incoming chair, um, which will be, it's, it's really exciting actually, it'll take us to the, to the next level. Mm. Um, we're an impact investment, triple bottom line. Um, you know, no good being in the renewables market if, if we're not focused on the environment. And, and socially responsible. So um, we're focused on regional development, um, indigenous employment and workforce diversity. Um, we'll be responsible for creating 8,000 jobs. Um, so that's both direct employees and upstream. One of, the, one of our big focuses is to develop the lithium ion battery material supply chain from mined product to to battery grade product at the moment, um, we export 100% of our um, of our mine product. It's value added in Asia or the US, and we buy it back as batteries. Which, you know, it, unfortunately, that's not the only industry that suffers that fate. But at least we can do something about that. So, so we'll, within three years, our target is to be using 100% Australian supplied product uh, in the fact in the factory. Fantastic. Uh, the, the business um, modelling is, has got a 30% EBITDA. Um, well, Mark, we'll probably just have to jump on to Q&A in a couple of moments. So I'll give you a, a quick, quick time to wrap up and then we'll jump to the... We'll get, the questions are pouring in, so... Um, are they? Right, eh? No yeah. problem at all. No, I'm at, at the end anyway. So um, we're, we're um, requesting $30 million in a uh, combination of debt and equity financing to, to accelerate the deployment. So that was, that was about it, Christian. Fantastic. Thanks, Mark. We can't wait to see what you can achieve with uh, Energy Renaissance in the next 12 months and, and how quickly the, that particular industry can progress in that same time as well. So thank you very much for the overview. So as mentioned, we have got a lot of questions uh, pouring in. So I'll, um, I'll jump straight into them. Um, so the first one's for Michael Lord. So Michael, um, why is Australia better positioned for REIPs than say Japan, Germany or China? Oh, yeah. So, yeah, I chose those examples because simply, you know, I, I, I was at the University of Melbourne for a year um, at the Climate and Energy College, which was a collaboration with Germany. So I got to work with German colleagues and the, the Germans are taking the, the transition to renewables really seriously. 
but just because of their natural endowments in solar and wind, um, replacing their current energy use with renewables will be a massive challenge. It's very hard for them to consider something like doubling or trebling um, their en energy inputs from renewables, um, which is something we can consider in Australia. In fact, really the sky is the limit in Australia just because um, we have a relatively low population, it's a huge country, and it's very sun sunny and quite windy. Um, there are very few industrial developed countries in that position. Fantastic, thank you, Michael. The next one is for Mark. Mark, aren't battery storage costs forecast to drop in the future? If so, how do you ensure that you stay competitive? Yeah, so the, the, the cost per kilowatt hour will significantly drop. Um, what's causing that though is energy density of batteries. Um, you saw the Tesla battery day announcements last week. It's all about increasing energy density, which drops the, the, the dollars per kilowatt hour. And that, that was the main driver of us seeking an international um, technology partner in Cadenza um, to ensure that we stayed level pegging with the, with the pack on energy density. Mm, fantastic. Thank you, Mark. Uh, Clark Butler, um, what kind of return can investors get when investing in a project like a renewable energy industrial precinct? Well, investor return uh, it has a direct impact on electricity price. So it's actually a slightly circular argument. Um, we're, we're really looking for the lowest cost of equity possible to, um, at this scale uh, and really in single digits. Um, part of that is driven by um, government debt and, and a role of government to underwrite the power purchase agreements so that we can create really attractive energy prices for the precinct. Because in the end, the best thing for Australia is reduced electricity prices into these precincts so that it can drive jobs through, through the, um, the industries that are able to be there. Um, so I'm not saying it's a, it's a place for tech investors to go. It's uh, the, the energy side of it should be very low cost of equity. The, the tech investors should be investing in, in batteries, um, like Mark says. Mm. Fantastic. Thank you very much for that, Clark. Uh, the next question for Aaron. How would Star of the South help to unlock a broader offshore wind industry in Australia? Sure, it's a really good question. And um, while there's a lot of attention on Star of the South, we've been really pleased to see other announcements recently uh, off the coast of WA, um, equally new, uh, Newcastle's been talked about. And I think the, the key point is the, the regulation and the policy development. And we've been working really closely with the federal government and, and I would like to acknowledge their consultative approach in formulating this regulation for the offshore wind sector. And I think that partnership between private sector and government working through those policy matters does give confidence to other, other parties to come and invest and explore the wind resource. I think the, the fact that uh, Australia has, has uh, you know, strong coastline, uh, I think there's something like 85% of our population is within 50 kilometres of the coast, so, so we're close to load centres. Mm. Um, and when the technology of offshore wind progresses, particularly to floating technology, um, that's where many more opportunities open up. So I think this is a, a still a relatively new industry in comparison to some of the other energy generators that have been around for a while. Um, but we are seeing that fast growth. And I think the confidence in that policy setting is, is going to lead to further investment. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Erin. Uh, Simon Curry, um, you spoke about how Australia could use local procurement to support demand for local manufacturing. Just how much more stuff can we make onshore at a competitive price? Well, you know, the, the other Simon um, demonstrated what you can do with his, uh, with what was included in, uh, you know, VRET, where we got very competitive prices for the VRET with much higher levels of local content, and we beat the local content targets for both solar and wind. Uh, if you don't try, you won't achieve. Uh, and that's been the, you know, the message right across, you know, it's not, we're not the first place to try this, um, but there's been very, you know, successes in all sorts of parts of the world. Uh, and it really goes back to the things which Clark and Michael have highlighted. We need to look at the natural strengths. Uh, we need to build off existing industries, you know, like the steel industry, like the aluminium industry. Uh, starting things which we've never done before from scratch, 
will be much, much harder. If we were to say, hey, we're going to do you know, nuclear, uh, build upon the uranium uh, mining and effectively move into uh, a, you know, a startup nuclear industry, that's going to be really hard. Um, but for other things, like to build upon what we've got with Keppel Prince and effectively produce a world scale tower manufacturing plant, uh, I can't see why we won't be competitive once we get to scale. If we don't get scale, we'll end up with uncompetitive industries. Mm, fantastic. Thank you, Simon. Uh, back to Mark, uh, Mark Chilcott for this one. Can you speak to the sort of considerations that drive the decision as to lo the location uh, for your project? This might provide some benefit to others when thinking about the locations of REIPs. Yeah. Okay. So there were two primary considerations for us. There were many considerations, obviously, but two primary. The first one was access to a deep water port. Um, we'll initially be importing and 60% of our product ultimately will be export to Southeast Asia. Um, so that was the first one. The second one was access to research. So access to universities, to CSIRO, um, and for, for two purposes, one for the purpose of research, but the other one for the purpose of engagement of staff. So they were really the two primary drivers for the, for the location. Fantastic, thank you, Mark. Michael Lord, so where else do you see this kind of thing happening in Australia? Um, we didn't find out or I didn't find out until recently that there is um, something that looks a bit like a renewable energy precinct underway in Western Australia. I, I might have the pronunciation of this place uh, wrong. It's called the Okaji um, Hub and it's near Glad. Uh, it's near, um, it's in the Midwest. Um, I can't remember the name of the place I'm looking for, but Midwest of Western Australia. Um, but that one is focused on hydrogen. So we think that they've got the right idea in Western Australia, but let's not just focus just on hydrogen in which there isn't yet a big international um, trade, but there is a big international trade in aluminium and in uh, all sorts of other metals and chemicals. Um, so um, let, let's use that model and spread it elsewhere in Australia. Uh, I think I'd also pick out the copper stream project in mm. Northwestern uh, Queensland, where they're building a transmission line um, which, which really will open up the possibility of a renewable energy industrial precinct at either end of that transmission line. So one end is Townsville, the other end is Mount Isa. Uh, the transmission line can um, power uh, the existing industry in Mount Isa with renewable energy, but to also open up opportunities to all sorts of metals uh, manufacturing along that line. Um, and they've had an economic analysis done of that metals manufacturing and showed that with the cheaper power produced by solar and wind, it, um, it makes it extremely cost effective. Mm, fantastic. Thank you, Michael. Simon Corbell, um, is renewable powered manufacturing consistent with the low emissions energy roadmap? Well, absolutely. I think it is. Um, Michael, the, the need for transitioning heavy industry and protecting incumbent operational heavy industry from uh, a, the risks, financial, uh, economic and environmental of a carbon constrained future are very, very important. So from our perspective, we would say that enabling heavy industry to switch to an electrified solution, enabling heavy industry to uh, get the, the firm dispatchable capacity it needs from a clean energy source with storage is uh, absolutely consistent uh, with the broader technology roadmap. Um, of course, what also comes into play here for heavy industry is energy efficiency. And the heavy industry roadmap has identified energy efficiency as one of its key priorities also. So when you look at the capacity for re tooling and re-engineering of certain heavy industry operations, improved energy efficiency, and a switch to clean energy generation with storage. Uh, we believe it's a compelling proposition and in fact essential if we're gonna protect um, those existing heavy industry operations and the very large workforces that are dependent on them, many of which are central to key regional economies. Mm, fantastic, thank you, Simon. Clark. Um, can renewable uh, industrial, uh, renewable and industrial precincts work without the aluminium smelter as part of the energy equation? 
Yes, I think they can. Um, they need large demand loads. So w w the the smelters are, are a natural centre of that, um, which is why I've focused so far on Gladstone and the Hunter Valley uh, and, and Latrobe Latro Latro and Portland operators kind of combined um, precinct. But, but any industrial zone that has large energy usage, and I'm thinking um, Quinana, Wyala, Port Kembla, um, has all the characteristics necessary for um, aggregating that demand load and creating the kind of renewable um, supply that, that can change the, the dynamics of the industry and reduce pricing. Mm, fantastic. Thank you, Clark. Um, so this is a quick whip around to all project proponents. So I'll get you to all unmute. Um, so what is the time frame to get your project up? So we'll go in reverse order, Mark. Okay, so ours is um, eight, un, under the current funding, it's eight years to get to 5.3 gigawatt hours per annum manufacture. Um, starting from now, we're, we're shovel ready at the moment. Um, that could be brought forward by about four years with an additional $30 million um, investment. Fantastic. Thank you, Mark. Simon Curry. Um, so, yeah, so aspects of the Walker Energy Project are well underway. And, and I think one thing we always forget about, and it's really important to, to look at everyone who's involved, the development cycle employs a lot of people that are different people than during the construction cycle. So when everyone says, when are you going to be shovel ready? Actually getting to shovel ready employs a lot of people. And it's a really like, you know, you look at Star of the South, how many people are going to be employed between now and getting to construction? And they're different jobs than necessarily the construction job um, and important for city jobs. Um, so, you know, we are, you know, we're rolling, um, Vestas is working hard, we're working hard on Dungowan, we've got a big team already with all of the consultants and everyone. Um, we, uh, we would hope that the first projects will be breaking ground in 2022, um, you know, with a bit of help from Transcript. Fantastic. Thank you, Simon. Erin? Yeah, we are in the feasibility <coughs> phase, so still focused right now on developing the project, understanding the site conditions for offshore wind, collecting data out at sea, working through that policy. So if all things went well in that regard, we could see ramping up to full power uh, towards the end of this decade, sort of 27, 28. But it is a, a big long term proposition. Um, I endorse what Simon says. There's a lot of work happening at the moment. But ultimately, um, these projects do have long lead times and, uh, you know, we'll, we'll see what happens along the way. Fantastic. And Simon? Yeah, thanks, Christian. So Central Queensland Power is a multi-portfolio project. So it actually has between six to seven individual wind or solar projects that will be built and storage projects that will be built in a staged manner. The early stages can uh, commence construction by uh, around the middle of this decade. Uh, and the, the total portfolio can be complete uh, by the end of this decade. Uh, separately, the Central Queensland Industrial Park is able to be developed very quickly based on the land and availability that's already been made, uh, indicated to us through Cent uh, Queensland Government. So we believe that the Central Queensland Industrial Park component and the first stages of uh, the renewable energy generation is certainly possible uh, within the next five years. Fantastic. Thank you, Simon. <clears throat> we have three quick questions to round out the Q&A. So I'll just ask for a short response to each. So starting with Mark, is there a market uh, for an energy renaissance to open additional manufacturing sites in other parts of regional Australia? Um, so the short answer to that is yes. Um, we'll end up in uh, two locations, potentially three. Um, just needs to be close to a deep water port and, and universities. Fantastic. Thank you, Mark. Simon Corbell, um, is most of the policy asked regulatory facilitation or are financial guarantees significant too? So really the, the, main, the main policy ask is recognising that there needs to be some government support to underpin uh, the, the support direct <coughs> to heavy industry. So it is financial guarantees or some sort of cornerstone financial uh, offtake arrangement with a project that allows a large heavy industry participant to come in behind it with the tenor uh, and the um, pricing that works for them, I think is potentially important. And state-owned generators in Queensland have a, a potentially important role to play. Uh, but the broader policy ask, I think, is really around 
uh, a, a broader operating environment. It's about a state government saying, this is a priority for us. We do want to transition our heavy industry uh, centre centres to this, these new solutions. Uh, and we need uh, project proponents to respond to that clear leadership position. So I think if, if anything, the actual key question is the broader authorising environment within which the projects operate uh, and the very clear signals from government that this is a priority and needs to happen. Fantastic. Thank you, Simon. <clears throat> and Aaron, the completion dates for the project are mostly in the back half of the decade. How much can they be accelerated given requirements like transmission are slow? Yeah, I think that's a, a big question and it really depends on the location that you're looking at. So we do know um, there are some areas where, where there are grid issues that are widely publicised um, in Victoria here towards the west of the state um, in Gippsland Latrobe Valley, there's very good um, system strength. So I think that the question <coughs> is that funding support is always helpful. I don't think anyone would knock back um, funding contributions, but, but ultimately um, each situation is unique and, and needs to be looked at on a case by case basis. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Erin, and all of our project proponents for providing some wonderful oversight into your projects and asking some, uh, some, very, some very good questions that came up as well. So just to wrap up now, uh, so as far as future opportunities, so BZE will continue to advocate for the Million Jobs Plan and, and project opportunities in key locations. And we will email all attendees uh, with today's presentation and a short five question feedback survey, essentially just to gauge your feedback on this session and whether you think sessions like this will be um, valuable in the future. So um, that's a thank you very much for me. So as the chairperson of the Investment Reference Group, um, please feel free to reach out to me in that capacity as well. And now I hand over to the wonderful Heidi Lee, who's our Moon Jobs Plan Leader, just to close out the session. Thank you, Christian. And I think this is the right audience to say what an exciting afternoon, um, hearing about renewable energy power, manufacturing opportunities, and all the ways that this is already happening. So what I heard, manufacturers want renewable energy industrial precincts because they're great for business. They're competitive, they're efficient, and they position our manufacturers to capitalise on new green hydrogen markets. I heard that investors are looking for opportunities to create new low carbon investment op um, opportunities and to create a chance for placing billions of dollars of green investment into regional Australia. And Erin, it was really important, I think, as well, to hear that local communities need to keep up existing manufacturing jobs going strong and to give young people a local future. We need to not just keep those existing industries, but create new jobs in new markets. So I think with all of this demand and the benefits on the table and from really what was a small selection of the project opportunities that we got to hear from today, it's really clear that the shift to electric manufacturing and renewable powered manufacturing is already underway. It can happen sooner. We do, there is a role for governments in stepping up, sometimes with project funding, other times with policy support around this space. So one of the joys of BZE, of course, is the people that together around our work. So thank you again to all our presenters today. Michael, Clark, Christian, Simon, Erin, Simon again, and Mark. Thank you again to our Renewable Energy Industrial Precinct, our briefing paper partners, which were WWF, Ironbark and Energy Estate. Thank you to our staff team and all the volunteers who you don't see today, but they put in hundreds of hours behind the scenes to make all this work happen. And Thank you to our BZE funding partners who also make our work possible. We can't do it without you, especially those who've really dug deep recently in quite uncertain times. And they've been able to support our million jobs plan becoming part of this national conversation about a clean and healthy and low emissions economic recovery. So if you did find today's event valuable and you'd like to join our community of funders or partner with us on future strategic projects, you please do email me. Um, and thank you to all of you for attending today. It's been really great to share it with you and I'm looking forward to seeing you again soon.